Okay, I'm starting a video blog and the point of this blog is to just sort of informally present some papers and ideas that I find interesting. These are papers that are written by others and what I'm hoping for is that my students and postdocs will listen to this and then get motivated to actually go and read these papers. So here's the first paper I want to talk about. This is a really interesting paper. I enjoyed reading it quite a bit. It presents an algorithm, actually a framework, for sparse PCA and a number of related problems. And this appeared in SIAM Review in 2013. So let me just begin by describing classic PCA. So you're given a matrix A, which is an N by N symmetric and positive definite matrix and typically A, the matrix A is the covariance of some data that you're looking at. So this is typically a data covariance matrix and often the uh, covariance matrix is not positive definite but it's just positive semi-definite but you can make it positive definite by simply adding a diagonal term. So if you replace your matrix A with A plus sigma squared I, then this matrix is positive definite and it has the same principal components as A. So from now on, we'll just assume that A is positive definite. So if A is symmetric and positive definite, it has eigenvalues that are real and positive and you can arrange them in a decreasing sequence. So from lambda one through lambda n, and then you can index the corresponding eigenvectors. And these eigenvectors arranged in this form are the principal components. Okay, now there are many algorithms for actually calculating principal components. There are two that are relevant to this paper and, and let me talk about those. The first is an optimization method. And this method says that if you maximize with respect to x, x in Rn, so x is just an n-dimensional column vector, this quadratic form, the quadratic form x transpose Ax, subject to the two norm of x equal to 1, then the x at which the maximum is achieved, which means the argument of this maximization problem, is actually E1. It's the first principal component. And what the paper does is that it generalizes this method. And we'll come to that in a second. So there is another method for finding principal components. And it's called the power method. And in the power method, you generate a sequence of x's. So you begin with some arbitrary x0, from that you generate x1, from which you generate x2, and so on. And what the power method does is that it creates the sequence in such a way that it converges to E1. So in the ith step, you take xi minus 1, you apply a to it, so you get a times xi minus 1, you set the norm of that vector to 1, so you divide this by its norm, its two norm. And this thing is xi. This is the output of the ith iteration. And you keep iterating this to generate that sequence. And that converges to E1. So the method we're going to discuss, uh, it turns out, is also related to the power method. So now let me turn and discuss sparsity. So suppose we have a vector x, and x is an Rn, so it has n components. So when we say x is sparse, what we really mean is that there are a number of components of x that are 0.
And one way of measuring the amount of sparsity is to simply count the number of non-zero components of x, and that's called the zero norm of x. So the zero norm of x, by definition, is the number of non-zero components of x. And that's it. That's all I need to uh, say about sparsity. And so now let's move on to talk about sparse PCA. So in sparse PCA, we look at the optimization problem where we maximize with respect to x, the old quadratic form x transpose ax subject to the constraint 2 norm equal to 1, and that's just classic PCA. But we additionally ask that the zero norm of x be less than or equal to k. And the argument at which this maximum is achieved is called the sparse principal component. Okay. What the paper does is it takes this problem and systematically converts it into a problem for which there's a very nice solution. So let's just see how it does that. So in the first step, what the paper does is that it takes that equality constraint and converts it into an inequality constraint. So now we consider the problem maximize with respect to x, x transpose ax with the constraint that the 2 norm be less than or equal to 1 and the 0 norm be less than or equal to k. The paper shows that the maximum value of this problem is identical to the maximum value of that problem and moreover the x at which the maximum is achieved for the second problem is also identical to the x at which the maximum is achieved for the first problem. Now it turns out the second problem is more amenable to the numerical method. So this is the problem that we're going to solve. So to solve this problem, the paper makes a number of observations. The first observation is this. So this is a quadratic form with a positive definite a, and then that means that this is a convex function of x. This constraint set, it's easy to see, is a compact set. So the problem that we're interested in is in maximizing a convex function, actually a strictly convex function in this case, over a compact set. So what we want to do is maximize a convex function over a compact set and there is a classic algorithm for doing that called conditional gradient with unit step and the paper shortens that name to con grad u and so that's what the paper does it applies con grad u to this problem now when you apply con grad u to this problem you end up with an iterative algorithm. So again, like the power method, the iterative algorithm begins with some x0, it then goes on to construct x1, x2, and so on. And the when that sequence converges, you get the solution to the problem that we're interested in. So what is this iteration? So the iteration looks like this. In the ith iteration, you generate x sub i, and x sub i is the argument that maximizes with respect to x, the inner product of x, a, x minus 1, the result from the previous iteration, subject to the same constraints as above. So the 2 norm of x e less than or equal to 1, and the zero norm of x less than or equal to k. There's a couple of things worth noticing here. 
x minus 1 is the result of the previous iteration, so that's constant. And what that means is that this term is constant. So the only place in the objective function that the variable occurs, the variable over which we are maximizing, is here. And what that means is that this objective function is linear in x. And so that's really interesting. We've taken a quadratic problem and now reduced it to a sequence of linear problems. And so if that linear problem is easily solvable over that compact constraint set, then this iteration is really simple. And what the theory of Congrad U says is that if you repeat this iteration, this will converge to the solution of the above problem. The paper then goes on to show how this maximization problem can be solved. And in fact, this has a closed form solution. So the closed form solution is this. The closed form solution is that xi equals an operator t I'm about to define of a x i minus 1 divided by the 2 norm of t a x i minus 1. Now let me explain t um, step by step. So first let's just understand a x i minus 1. So recall that a is n by n xi is uh, n by 1, so this whole thing is a column vector A that has n components to it. So let's say the components are A1 through An. And in general, of course, A is not sparse. So what T does is that T sparsifies A in a specific manner. So when I apply T to A, I get a vector that retains k components of A, sets everything else to zero, and the components that are retained are the ones that have the k largest absolute values. So T of A, I'll say, retains k components with the largest absolute values. So let's say A1 survives, maybe A2, A3 don't survive, maybe A4 survive, and so on. So of course by construction the zero norm of TA is less than or equal to K. So that's what T does. And then you normalize T A X I minus 1 to have a unit 2 norm you iterate that, and at convergence, you get the sparse PCA. So let's put all of that together. So the i iteration looks like this. You begin with x i minus 1. You apply a to it to get a x i minus 1. You then sparsify it by applying t. You normalize t to have a unit norm. and that is xi. You repeat this till convergence and at convergence you have the sparse principal component. Now there's a couple of things to notice here. First notice that by construction the zero norm of this term is less than or equal to k. And here all we are doing is multiplying the vector by a scalar, so the zero norm of this entire term is also less than or equal to k. So that satisfies the sparsity constraint. And also notice that because we are dividing by the two norm, the two norm of this entire term equals one. So xi then satisfies the constraints that we want the sparse principal component to satisfy. The second thing to notice is, notice what happens if we set t equal to the identity operator. So if t equals the identity operator, this iteration is simply the same as the power method. 
And what that means is that you can think of this entire method as a modified power method. And so this is really interesting. Congrad U gives us a method that is very similar to the power method. Now what the authors do is that they show that in a number of problems that are related to sparse PCA, you can apply Congrad U and you can get something very similar to the modified power method to solve all of those problems. And here on the second page of the paper, uh, they list all of the problems that they can solve using Congrad U. The first problem is simply a modification of sparse PCA where the zero norm constraint is replaced by a one norm constraint. And then they show that you can also use Congrad U for penalized PCA rather than constrained PCA. And the idea here simply is that you no longer have the zero norm as a constraint, but instead you penalize your objective function with the zero norm. And of course also with the one norm. And then finally they look at problems where the L0 penalty is replaced by some sort of a nice approximation to the L0 penalty. So this GP of X is a nice version of the zero norm and nice usually means it's continuous or continuously differentiable and so on. And so what they show is that Congrad U can solve all of these problems and the resulting algorithms for all of them look a lot like the modified power method. So that's it. That's all I have to say. So I really enjoyed this paper and I strongly encourage you to read it. It's actually fairly accessible and extremely well written.